Thank you guys for coming. It's so nice to be here. Uh, my name's Riley Miles, uh, and I couldn't be happier to be together again. I was with you in San Diego. Happy to be back. Uh, happy to be gathering and getting back into a little bit of a normal cadence here. Um, for those that don't know me, I've been doing case management software for over 17 years now. Uh, and really, I'm, I'm humbled to be part of one of the best vendors in the business. I work for Tyler Technologies. Uh, as a general manager, I have the opportunity, and really I look at it as the responsibility, as do the other uh, managers at Tyler, to be looking forward uh, and be forward thinking to what the future may hold for all of the markets that we serve, courts being one of those especially. Today, I hope you will be willing to participate with me in having a dialogue about the potential that we have of coming out of the pandemic. And, and we've talked about this before, but truly reimagining something that previously may have seemed out of reach or impossible. Changing, changing what we do or adapting what we do or even completely uh, reinvigorating what we do is sometimes a, a tough, intimidating task, but I think we've been given a gift uh, from the pandemic and we've seen the public expectations start to change. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, I hope you'll be willing to share your thoughts and your ideas on how the, the pandemic has changed your expectations personally. And this could be in general, uh, outside of the courts, outside of business, just personally, what are some of the things that you've seen changed? Uh, and then also, what are some of the public expectations that are coming in to your courthouses? These presentations can be boring, believe me, I know. So I'm gonna try and break the mold a little bit today and not just talk about the future of court. So I'm gonna start with a story that is completely unrelated, but I will try to relate it in the form of an analogy and it's something that happened in my life. Uh, it's a story that really changed kind of forever how I, I look at something that's, that's affected me. To, to start off, I have to, I have to give an intro into what the, the topic that's not related will be. So I am diabetic, type one. Um, I know, shocking, right? You're like, how could somebody so fit and uh, thin and, and uh, uh, athletic uh, be diabetic? Well, it's as my coworkers that I had dinner last night with can attest to, I'm a very committed eater. Uh, I, I definitely try and, and go big whenever we go out. Um, I'm sure you're all probably familiar with the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but just in case, I'll talk through uh, a little bit just to, to elaborate so we have something to build on. Type 1 is where your pancreas basically quits, stops working, stops producing any insulin. So anything that you eat in the form of sugar or carbohydrates, will be broken down into a sugar that insulin helps process and, and works out uh, or, or gets that sugar out of your blood, turns it into energy, so on and so forth. Uh, type one diabetic, your pancreas basically stops working. Um, it's, it's hard to determine the cause of that. It can be a number of different things. It can be like diet is certainly one of the things that can, can help contribute to that. Um, genetics are another one that contribute to that. It can also be like an autoimmune type situation where you may have an infection, your body's attacking the infection, and then almost as collateral damage, your pancreas gets attacked as well and stops producing insulin. But that's basically the cause. Um, I tend to try and blame it on my family because uh, that seems like the right thing to do. From the time I was born, uh, we have this old family recipe and you guys, now you guys will really know why I'm diabetic. It's called scones and chocolate. And we make homemade scones, the kind that you get at like the, not like the English ones, the British ones that have like, they're kind of thick and they have the blueberries or something in them. These are like the scones that you get from the diner, like the greasy, you flatten them out and you, and you fry them up, you cook the scone. Then we have an old fudge recipe that we, like we make fudge with every year. We make the fudge, but we keep it warm and liquidy. We don't stir it and make it hard so it's liquid. And then you take the scone and you use it as the vessel to get the chocolate. It's, I mean, now it's no mystery why this has happened to me and actually some of my cousins and uncles. And anyway, it's, it's definitely a family thing. Um, 
<laughs> you get the point. I was diagnosed with this uh, about 20 years ago. And if you told me at that point that I would have stood up in front of a crowd of friends and coworkers and complete strangers and announced that I'm type one diabetic, I would have told you, you are insane. You're absolutely crazy. I never wanted to know, I never wanted anybody to think anything differently of me. So it was something that I was like, oh, I can do this, I can manage this, but I wanna keep it hidden. Nobody needs to know about this. It was something that was kind of weird and foreign. And I'm like, I just, I just don't need or want to bring that up. When you're, but that's kind of changed and, and we'll kind of talk about that path and that journey, navigating that path today. Um, when you're first diagnosed, the doctors do a fantastic job of trying to scare you to death. Um, so they tell you, hey, uh, if you don't take care of this, you could go blind. Uh, if you don't take care of this, you could lose a toe or a foot or a leg or a hand or an arm. And you come out of the doctor's office thinking, I'm never going to eat a, a, a piece of candy ever again. Uh, I'm gonna eat broccoli, cauliflower and uh, tofu for the rest of my life. And I'm fine with that because I won't have to lose any toes and I'll be able to see uh, for the rest of my life. It's not necessarily that bad. If you're dedicated to taking care of it and you monitor it and you, you watch what's going on, uh, it's something that can be managed. It's, it's one of those things though, that it's, it's in order to keep up on it, in order to stay ahead of it, it's the first thing that you think of when you wake up and it's the last thing you think of when you go to sleep, unless you are presenting at NACOM. And then those are the things that you think about before you go to bed and, and wake up the next morning. Um, but it's something that's always there, something that you have to continuously think about and maintain. So when I was first uh, diagnosed, I was given a vial of insulin and a bag of syringes. And they basically are like, do you understand how this works? And I was pretty young at the time. And I'm like, no, I don't understand how this works. Will you please show me? So we went through, uh, you know, getting some insulin into the syringe and giving yourself a shot and all that stuff. And then you do testing your blood sugar. Like you have to test your blood sugar all the time. You want to know where you are uh, so that you can be able to, to give the right amount of insulin. You have to do the calculations of how much do you need for what you're going to eat or if your blood sugar is high, how much do you need there? And then another added benefit is when you're type 1 diabetic, you also have the, the bonus prize of being hypoglycemic. You can go low as well. And that's kind of where the story uh, will, will begin. If, if I look at where I was managing then versus where I'm managing now, and I have this awesome insulin pump and I'll talk to you a little bit about it, but it's, it's really cool and makes managing it. I think every type one diabetic should just be given this when they, when they first get diagnosed because it just helps manage it so much better. So imagine if you had to keep track of your blood sugar, the target that you want to be at is about 100. Uh, that's like perfect. Everybody in this room is probably about at 100, maybe one, 105, 110, uh, 95, something like that. When you first go in and, and you're becoming diabetic and get tested, your blood sugar is like 800, 900, 1000, like astronomically out of proportion to where it should be. They teach you to, to test your blood sugar and then to be able to give insulin to accommodate that. Well, the problem is when you're testing your blood sugar, you test it and it could be like, hey, you're 130. You're doing great. Good job. You don't know at that point in time if you're 130 headed towards 250 or if you're 130 headed towards 50 or if you're just 130 headed to 125 and you're doing great and you're just keeping everything nice and balanced. It's almost like if you were managing your caseloads in your courts with just meticulously placed sticky notes. Like it can, you can do it and you can probably get through it, but it's not like the best way to be doing that. Um, so that's what I did for years and years and years because I could keep this little pen in my pocket. It was always there. I could go into a discreet place, test my blood sugar. No one ever needed to know that I was diabetic. The doctors would tell me about this better way, about this pump. When you have one of these pumps, you also have like a sensor that you, you kind of swap it out. Uh, for, it's, it'll stay in for about a week and then you swap it out. But anyway, the sensor reads your blood sugar all the time. So it's, it's constantly checking, just like your brain does in every one of your bodies. It's checking to say, oh, you're at 100. You know, oh, you're going up to 110, 120, 130. And then it tells the pump, hey, you need to give him a little bit of an added dose there just to help keep this down. And the pump kind of acts like this fake pancreas, but it's an automated way of managing something that's otherwise pretty hard and pretty tedious to do. So how did I get from 
never wanting anyone to know that I was diabetic and just trying to keep that all in my pocket and, and just manage it to standing up here and telling a whole room full of people that I am. It starts with a, a story that you may not believe, but I swear on my life, everything about this is true and it scared me to death. So, uh, it was about 2010, uh, 2009, 2010. I was on a trip to a conference in Philadelphia. Um, we had, I was traveling from Salt Lake City, so I had to wake up super early. We wanted to get there early enough to get things set up before the afternoon uh, session. So me and my travel uh, partner, we'll call him Greg. Uh, me and Greg uh, were headed out to Philadelphia, so we left really early. I hadn't had breakfast, uh, hadn't had much sleep the night before, both of which are kind of factors that you want to watch out for. Um, flew, flew to Philadelphia. It was kind of hectic, finding our bags, grabbing stuff. Some, I think our packages were delayed or something that were going to show up to the, to the hotel. So we were trying to square all that away. Uh, but anyway, we get there and we got there way later than we thought. So I hadn't eaten anything all day. I, I didn't think there was a problem. Uh, seemed fine. We were checked in at the hotel. Um, so he and I said, okay, let's go get settled in. Then we'll meet downstairs in the lobby and we'll go across the street to a hard rock cafe. And I, I think this is a picture of the actual hard rock cafe that's there. Um, we're like, let's go eat at the hard rock cafe. So I put all my stuff away. Uh, about 20 minutes later, I walk out to the, to the elevator, push the down arrow, step into the elevator, hit the lobby button, the elevator doors close. The next thing I remember is I'm sitting and th uh, this is not how I was sitting. I'm hunched over like a folding table. There's a folding table somewhere. I'm hunched over the folding table. The room is completely dark around me. There's like a little crack around a doorway, a little crack of light that's coming through. And I'm thinking, what? What is going on? This is really weird. Like, this is a weird dream. If I just go back to sleep, I'm sure I'll wake up in my hotel room. Everything will be back to normal. So I kind of like hunch over the, the table again. Kind of, I think I fall back asleep. Then I wake back up and then it's like, oh crap, I'm still in this dark room. What, I don't know where I am. So like there's a little bit of panic that sets in at that point. Like I, I had to have been drugged. I've been uh, mugged. My kidneys have been harvested. Like I don't know what's going on. So I'm checking everything everywhere to make sure that it's all there and it is. And I'm like, okay, I need to get out of this room, obviously. So I go over to the door that has the crack and the, and the, the light in it, open the door up, and I am in the bowels of some large building, uh, and, and I'm looking around for signs or anything. There's an exit sign that I thought about taking, and then I look up, there's another sign that says lobby, or main lobby, and it's pointing that direction down the hall. So I close the door behind me and I'm walking down this hallway. I walk past the big laundry room and people are just in there folding laundry and, and doing the laundry stuff. Walk past the kitchen where people are cooking stuff. Nobody pays any attention to the stranger that's just walking the halls. I get out into the lobby and thank goodness I'm in the hotel that we were in. So I jump into the elevator, run back up, check every sing thing again to make sure that everything's okay. Everything is, I have my phone, I have my wallet, I have everything. Every, no, it's like nothing was touched. So I call my wife and I'm like, oh my honey, like so, something's wrong. Tell her what has just happened. She's like, this is crazy. She asked me the same question. She's like, did you check? Have your, do you have your kidneys? Do you have your wallet? Do you, have, do you feel weird? We're going through the same checklist. And I'm like, no, no, no. She's like, what do you remember? So I'm trying to think about it. And I have, I have one, oh, sorry, this was the, the photo that was supposed to be up. I have one recollection of a 7-Eleven. I, like th I, th I remember a 7-Eleven sign, and I have this cakey taste in my mouth. That's all, I, that's all I know. That's all I tell her. And she's like, that is super weird. Call Greg and ask Greg what's going on. So I call Greg, and he's like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, well, actually, not too good, Greg. Things are weird. Uh, and I tell him about what's kind of happened. I'm like, was I acting weird? Did we meet up? What's going on? He's like, yeah, you came down. Uh, we met in the lobby. You didn't say anything, which should be the first indication that something's wrong with me because I'm, I'm a happy talker. He's like, we went over to the restaurant. 
they, we asked for a table, like they said it was about a 20 minute wait. So we wandered around the, the gift shop for a minute at the Hard Rock. And then he said, when, when the hostess came back to say our table's ready, I went with her and you, meaning me, I walked out of the restaurant. And he's like, I just thought you were mad or you were doing something important or I did something wrong or something. So he's like, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was weird, but that's what happened. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Told him the whole story about everything that's going on. And he's like, oh, well, what is, is there something I can do? What do you want to do? And I'm like, Greg, is there a 7-Eleven that's close by? And he's like, yeah, I think there's one right across the street from the hotel. And we are downtown Philadelphia, right across the street from the hotel. And I said, will you go down there with me? And he's like, sure, let's go. <laughs> so he's probably thinking this guy's going to stand me up again. We go down to the lobby. We walk out and the 7-Eleven sign is literally straight as you walk out the door. There's a 7-Eleven across the street. We walk into the 7-Eleven and the two clerks that are standing behind the desk, they're working. They look up and they see me and Greg and they take a huge step back and they just look at each other and they look at me and they look at Greg. And, and you can tell that they're wondering what in the heck is happening again. So I walk up to the counter and I'm like, what, was I in here recently? And they don't say a word, they just nod. And I was like, did I take anything? And the, the one clerk, bless his brave heart, uh, steps one step forward and he goes, two donuts. And I was like, two donuts? <laughs> so the unconscious, so when, when you have that like acute hypoglycemia, when it happens really fast, your blood sugar drops really fast, your brain has to decide where it's going to allocate resources. It has a limited amount of sugar that's gone on, a little bit of uh, energy that it needs to be able to do what it needs to do. So it kind of decides to cut certain things off. Memory being one of them and, and being in that moment. Um, so I don't know if you've ever heard of like diabetics getting in car accidents or things like that. Sometimes it's because of that type of situation where your blood sugar drops uh, super fast and you just check out. Your eyes are open, you're moving. For me, I'm not usually talking. And then that's, that's kind of what's going on in that situation. So I said, look, I'm so sorry. Can I please pay you for the donuts? He's like, yeah. So he rings them up. I pay for the donuts. So I don't have a criminal record. I'm super grateful that they didn't call the police, but my brain was saying, Hey, I know you're not here and you're not present, but I'm going to walk in, grab us some stuff that we need. And then we're going to walk back out and hide out in the, in the bowels of this hotel room in a storage room. So that's needless to say that scared me to death, maybe more than the the initial uh, dialogue with the doctors. So that that was kind of my path towards making a change in something that before I would have thought there's no way I'm ever going to wear a pump that everybody could see and be like, oh, that guy, he's diabetic, yada, yada, yada. It totally transformed my my way of thinking. I'm like, I've got to do something to make sure that I'm top of, on top of this. Now, one of the causes was I was so meticulous about trying to keep my blood sugar at, at around 100 that I found myself consistently going low because so many things can impact your blood sugar like that anyway. By getting on this, I've never had another one of those episodes again. I've had this uh, for like five years, hasn't happened uh, ever since. It's been an, an amazing change, an amazing transformation. So I said I would try and relate that to what we do. So in a minute though, not quite yet. Let's talk, let's talk public expectations. Since the pandemic, and this is where, so I have my friend John, he, he's got a microphone, so I would love to hear from you. I'm gonna ask a few questions as we go through this. And we have, so I have friends from Tyler here, all of which will be taking some copious notes. This is gonna be your opportunity to contribute to what we take back and what we build. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk through what are some of the things that have changed for you, just in general. When you look at coming out of the, the pandemic, what has changed that you thought, man, I, I don't think I ever would have done this before for had that not happened. What do you think? What are some ideas? Right here. Working from home. Working from home. She said working from home. I totally agree. Like none of us would have thought that we would be working from home doing what we're doing as connected as we are. That's completely changed, right? Here in the back. Zoom. Zoom. How so? What do you mean? Yeah. It was, we had to quickly figure out 
how to get our court up and running. And we worked together uh, within 30 days and to get all of our courts up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and even personally, right? Like, how much more connected are we than before? A ton. We we've all adopted new ways of communicating with each other, or or maybe better ways of communicating with each other, right? What else comes to mind? Back here. Trials without having to provide access to victims. Yeah. Still have limited space available in the courtroom. Jury trials with limited Sorry. space, <laughs> for sure. Think. So this is a picture of my mom. Yeah, you can probably tell. Um, we, my mom has not gone into a grocery store for like 14 months. This is, this is a woman who went to the grocery store every couple of days for all my life growing up. Uh, she hasn't gone inside a grocery store for 14 months. I don't know that she ever will. And it's not that she's scared. I, I think she's vaccinated and, and we think she probably had COVID at some point. Like she's doing very well. It's the convenience that she has discovered that she, ne and, and I'm like, mom, this, this whole call Walmart, do your, do your order, drive up, they put it in your car or have it delivered to your house. That's been around for a long time. That was pre COVID. Nobody used it. She uses it exclusively now and loves it. It's totally transformed her life. I don't think she'll ever go back uh, to, to the actual traditional grocery shopping. Uh, movies. This was one that came to mind. I love going to the movie theater. My family loves going to the movie theater. God, I haven't been to a movie theater in a long time because movies, some of the movies, you get early access to, right? So it's like, oh, I can, I can take my family to the movie and I don't know, spend 40 or 50 or 60 bucks or something on, on getting everybody there versus, oh, I could throw $20 at it and watch it from the couch uh, here at home. That sounds awesome. So that's, that's one of the things that's changed uh, for me and my family. There's a ton of things uh, that, are, that are changing for all of us. Like uh, one, of the, one of you said, connectivity. I think you were talking about Zoom, but in general, like we've adopted better practices. My mom, it's so funny, in, in her house, there's still a rotary phone. She's not that old, but there's still a rotary phone. I think she likes the nostalgia of it. Not, she doesn't use it anymore. It does have a line that's connected into it. You can, if I told my kids to go and make a phone call on it, they would be oblivious and think I was an idiot. Um, but it's still there. Like, she was not the prime target for doing like a FaceTime video call. Now you can't stop her from doing that type of uh, call. She's, she's on the phone all the time. Her friends, my kids, with us. In fact, there's sometimes I'm like, audio only, and then I'll talk to mom. Don't tell her I do that though. Um, but it's changed. Like she communicates so much better now uh, because of some of those things that, that she was really thrown into because of the pandemic. And it's been neat to see that change. I think all of us have seen things that are similar to this. We see shifts in how we do things, working from home, the way that we're connected. I was talking with one of our, uh, a husband of one of our clients in Arlington, Patrick, yesterday. And he said he, he has kind of a side business that he's coordinating running hundreds and thousands of miles of fiber optic cable in order to just enhance and make more pipe, is what he calls it, for us to be able to communicate and be online and consume things that are on there. So we're all making that investment in, in being connected and being online. We're also having seeing the infrastructure um, modified and taking place. So let's now move to the court. And I know we jumped on a couple of these with jury trials, with having to jump on Zoom to try and keep things up and running. Working from home is another one that I think we're seeing in the courts that's popping up. What else? Uh, what, what, are, what are some of the new expectations that the public are bringing along with them? What are you seeing from the general public? We have a lot of uh, QR codes that we're providing. Oh, right for people to apply for public defenders or fill out emergency protection orders. That's cool. And doing everything online. Yeah. You know, submitting their forms online and payments online and things like yeah. that. So not to get into too much detail, what are you doing? Like, how does that process work with the QR code and how does that translate into what you were saying? Well, and we have the QR codes for all the, uh, for the public defender forms. Mm -hmm. So when they go to the lower level courts, the QR code is posted, you know, in the in the court. So if they need a public defender for, you know, the initial preliminary hearing, yeah, that the court would point them to the QR code to apply. They can upload their financial forms, and they do everything 
um, through video as far as their interaction with the public defender. Uh, same with emergency protection orders. Yeah. A lot of times that happens at nighttime. Historically, the person who wants to file for protection overnight, they would have to go to the district court, the on-call MDJ, yeah. you know, to get that. But instead, they're, uh, they have a fillable form that they can do on their phone. They can do a video with, you know, the, the petition has a DocuSign yeah. uh, signature, and they can do a video with the MDJ rather than traveling out to the MDJ office. Because, you know, we know that ours are decentralized. Yeah. If they live in the city and they don't have transportation to go out to, you know, a 30-minute trek out to the, the on-call MDJ, they could do it by video. Yeah. Isn't it funny? Some of the things that we thought were just so, you just have to, you just have to do that 30 minute trek out there. That's, that's diminishing. I love it. I mean, I think the biggest issue with us is because we always had an electronic option. Uh -huh. The problem was with people who didn't have the ability to print the form sign it and then get it back to the court yeah. you know it's the middle of the night they yep. don't have a printer they don't have a scanner yeah so being able to do a fillable form with a docusign and email it back without having to print it out or anything was a big issue that has diminished yeah it's a game it's a game changer that we've had for a long time right that yeah. that technology wasn't invented during the pandemic but we finally were like okay now we're at, now everybody's going to get on board and utilize that also sorry just one second before your comment do you remember when a QR code first came out? I got to admit, I was one of the people that's like, that's stupid. Like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And now it's like QR code. You pull your phone, it reads it itself and takes you exactly where you want to go. We utilize that in some of our connectivity with our tools as well. Okay, sorry. Yes, no, here. Um, I think the biggest expectation that we're seeing from the public is that we aren't going to go back. We're, we're, I mean, they're expecting us to stay virtual, even coming out of a pandemic. They don't want to come to court anymore. They want to be able to just request that virtual and move on. Boy, now that we've cracked the door, right? Now that, that, now that we've seen what we can do and what we're capable of, now it's become like, I want that for, and I, that is, ooh, that is, that's amazing. And you never would have, you never would have, but maybe, I mean, I'm thinking we're at least 10 years, at least 10 years ahead of where we would have been otherwise, maybe 15, you know, with, with as slow as some things go and with, with as slow as expectations can be, we have, we have leapfrogged uh, where we would have been from the form of expectation. Thank you for sharing both of those. I appreciate it. Over here. I think the example was already given, but also the expectation of there are no office hours anymore. <laughs> We're open 24 seven. Doesn't that one suck though? It sucks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You, what, what? I can't just get on it at uh, 10. I'm a 1030 guy. I can't get on to 1030 at nine and, and take care of this. Are you kidding me? It's an expectation that that has boiled up, right? It's one that we're like, uh, we should be connected. We should have that option. I'm not advocating necessarily for it. I'm just saying, I, I hear you, I, I get that. Right here. One expectation is that um, our courts are fully staffed. And with the staff shortage that we're seeing across all industries, yep. there is simply not the manpower to do what we used to do. Amen, uh, we, see, we see that. We see that at Tyler. I know all, I mean, our competitors see that. Uh, different businesses across the country see that. It, it's perplexing. It's like, how can we all have so many job openings? Like, what, what's going on? Um, but to your point, I had that as one of my notes. Like, if, if I don't get any responses, we got to talk about what staff expectations are. Like, we have expectations of staff, but we also have expectations of having to improve and find efficiencies wherever we can in order to accommodate kind of the great uh, resignation or, or the situation that we're in right now, whatever that's going to be called, we have to figure out how to accommodate that. Thank you so much. Yes, back here. Staff is not doing what they were three years ago, which is the paper. Staff is now doing much, much higher level technology and having as a requirement to be able to multifast with four or five different software programs and keep going. Yeah. So the courts are not 
you know, just clerical anymore. It's yeah. different. It's a huge shift in Th expectation. Thank you so much. Our, our staff expectations of what we do and how we do it, I think largely for the best is, is improving. It's, it, I'm so glad you bring that up. Like as the technologist in me right now is like fist bump. Yes, they're not doing it the way that they did it, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, but there's also, there's a little bit of a learning curve and an adjustment that was taking place. But again, it's another one that I think we leapfrogged in, in coming out of the pandemic that, that our staff have really ramped up and, and they're, able, they're able to, but also have the burden of having to dig in and, and multitask and do a lot of those uh, multifaceted things. John, do we have another one? Yeah. I know for us, um, our court is experiencing the whole staffing issue as well, but yeah. not only are the public, they're expecting to do everything online, but staff who traditionally have not uh, teleworked or did any of those types of things, they are now expecting to, you know, their jobs to be teleworking and working remotely full time. So now we have to deal with process changes, yep. teleworking policies, things like that. So, I mean, not only is the public expecting certain things, but so is staff and yeah. those future employees that you're bringing on as well because of what's going on. I, I hear you. We, we see the same thing and I'm not sure what your percentages are, but I would venture a guess that we see, we see about maybe 15 to 20% of the staff that just kept coming in. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to keep coming to the office. That's, that's where I like working. That's where I get the best uh, out of my day. They kept coming in. We have probably another 50 or 60% that, that are like, hey, I'm interested in kind of a flex type situation. I like coming into the office, but I also really like doing some things uh, from my house. So I, I kind of want this flex option. And then there's another 15, 20% that are like, you know what? I'm not interested in ever coming back. So it's an interesting, and, and I don't think we're unique. I think we're seeing that everywhere, right? It's another uh, expectation for sure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think kind of piggybacking on that, it's the this change in expectation is fascinating because employees, you know, who five years ago would have never dreamed that that would be even a possibility it's now an expectation. It's not even a request. It's like, well, wait a minute, we've done this. And the same for the public. It's almost democratized the courts in this weird way where, I mean, who would have ever thought to even, we're getting requests from people. Wait a minute, what do you mean I have to show up in court? <laughs> when would yeah, we have ever so, asked that of our courts? Yeah, one of our other friends, um, were like, yeah, I, ex I don't expect to have to come. Yeah, Are you kidding I, me? exactly. And yeah. I think that's an interesting shift in even just that the court's relationship with, yeah. with our customers. So that's, that's an interesting dynamic. Oh, it is. It is. Thank you so much. There, we're going to have another, uh, well, I'll throw out some more questions as we go. But the ones that you have brought up are some that I hadn't considered. There's some that are forefront in our minds. I appreciate immensely uh, you guys sharing this with me. It confirms some of the things that we were thinking, uh, but also has spawned some thought uh, that we'll be able to take back and, and work from. If you guys are familiar with Richard Suskind, uh, he's a Brit and uh, not that that's a bad thing, uh, but he, he is a very forward thinking, progressive, what does the future of courts look like uh, type of thinker. He, he has his, uh, I think he has a law degree uh, from Oxford. He's a, a PhD. I know he spent time at Harvard, presents at Harvard uh, Law School quite often, but he's given us a few, uh, few different quotes. Can everybody read those okay? Or should we have some, uh, you want me to read them out or have a spokesperson or something? Can you see those in the back? Okay, I'll read through them real quick. So even in justice system, he, he gave this presentation at Harvard Law in August uh, 2021, so just a few months ago. Even in justice systems that we regard as the most advanced, dispute resolution in public courts generally takes too long, costs too much, and the process is unintelligible to all but lawyers. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that's what he's saying and, and one of his perspectives. Early instincts that remote courts might impede open justice have generally not been supported. I think you guys kind of confirmed that while we were talking today. In live streaming video proceedings, open justice has been maintained. Yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with that assessment. With, with the sentiments that are being expressed today, I think we're all uh, thinking uh, similarly. It's interesting, I'll, I'll get, I, I mean, I don't wanna get controversial, 
but I will ask this question. Um, Suskind, he wrote a book uh, that was really titled around the future of courts and, and he was trying to project out. I believe his book came out pre-COVID and his, if I were to summarize in the form of a quote, he was basically saying by 2030, all court business will be conducted virtually unless there is a compelling reason to meet in person. I mean, we can agree or disagree on that. Uh, there's a part of me that's like, okay, maybe for certain case types, like if I, I think if I'm being investigated or I'm, I'm, I'm accused of a felony, I'd really like to be in person. I would like to have, I like to see the jury right there. I would like to have the judge uh, be in the room and, and let's have that uh, really human dynamic going on there. But for some of the procedural things, maybe some of the low cost civil cases, um, those types of things, man, it kind of makes sense. I, like I kind of have the sentiment of some of the general public of, man, can, can this just be a little bit easier? I'm happy to go through, let, let's, let's work through this process. I'll pay my fine, it's good to go. Hey, and I'm not like a, a criminal. I'm not a massive criminal or, or even a minor criminal. I don't have, actually have a speeding ticket to my name. Oh, nope, there was one when I was 16. That's the only thing I've done. But I still find the, the value in, in having some of those efficiencies for the general public. What's that? I, well, but I went back and paid for him. So I don't know. I feel like I, I don't know. You're right. You're for, for a time there. It was, it wasn't armed robbery, but it was definitely theft or, or some type of, of code. I hope that, that I was able to rectify that. That's a good point. Um, so thinking about, let, let's think about, uh, the future journey and where we might be going. I want to pull from you. So I think a lot of you are already conceding the fact that you're already there, like you're already working towards being online. So I actually thought this might be more of a more of a pull to try and get some of those ideas. So thank you already for the for the ones that have shared for some of you that may not be there yet or even some that are still in that process. When you think through it, let's think about what would we have to see in order for court business to be done exclusively online. Maybe that's different case types. Maybe, maybe that's some different things. I think, let's also think for a second that, um, I mean, COVID's probably gonna be with us for a while. Like we see people that, I mean, when you, when you get it, you're out for a week, two weeks. Uh, there's some, some uh, quarantining that takes place. There's probably gonna be other illnesses and things that we have. So we see staff that are kind of gonna be uh, affected by that. What do we see having to be in place or what are some of those qualifiers that we'd be like, yeah, I think that could be uh, an area or a situation in, in where we'd be willing to go exclusively online. What are some of those that come to mind? And it may be, what are, what are the uh, circumstances that you are doing that already? Right here in the back, thank you. I would think um, um, those instances where there isn't a potential where a defendant needs to be remanded to jail. That seems to be the big hiccup, right? So when you're sitting there on the bench, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, and um, there's a potential that someone might need to serve a jail, it's really hard as a judge yeah. to um, sentence someone who's on a Zoom call, <laughs> right? It's impossible. Yes. Um, yeah. And so in the criminal world, that seems to be the hiccup from my perspective as yeah. a judge, but then also my fellow judicial officers, that that's a challenge. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. That's definitely one that I think is, there's a bit of an impediment and a roadblock there uh, for sure. And one that I don't know, I don't know that that's what we look to try and solve, right? Like there, there's benefits in how that's being done. Well, and, and to add to that, uh -huh. the other aspect of this that we have a lot of discussions about is to what extent is Zoom diminishing the formality and seriousness of the criminal case? Oh yeah. Right. I mean, when you're dealing with something that has impacted other people, has harmed people. Yeah. There needs to be a way for a judge to have a connection with the defendant at an appropriate time in an appropriate way mm -hmm. um, that that addresses the seriousness of the conduct committed in that case. And so, in the criminal world, I see that as being entirely problematic. Yeah. Speaking as, as a judicial officer. Uh, well, very well said. I mean, we all remember the, I mean, it's turned into a meme now, but I, I promise I'm here judge and I am not a cat. That was one. And then we, I think we had a defendant that was, he, he was in the middle of a surgery, 
steps off to the side and is like, yeah, let's go ahead and proceed. And the judge is like, how about let's not proceed? Well, yeah, so the formality of it uh, can be diminished for sure. I get that, thank you. That's Over here. Similar to what I was gonna say, our judge always starts with the disclaimer. You are appearing virtually, but that, that does not mean that, no, it is, it is not as formal as you standing before me in this courtroom. And the same procedure will apply to you as if you were standing here before me in my courtroom. Man, I really like that and appreciate that. I think even as like us as a vendor, general public, it would really benefit us to try and maintain that level of expectation. Like let's us set that expectation to say, oh yeah, there's a definite convenience factor but this is, this is exactly what you would be doing in person and all of the procedures and formalities and respect, I think that that deserves should be a part of it. Absolutely, I agree. And, and I think, I, I mean, just to give a little insight into some of the products, I think some of us as vendors, we try and, and create enhancements not, I don't want to diminish Zoom. I think it's been a fantastic tool, but there's things that we can build in such as like waiting rooms and queues to where you're not just logging into a general mass uh, hearing. We're very selective and, and it's very, now you'll be let into this virtual room. You're there with the judge, with the attorneys that are present. It's only you, you, you can have sidebar. Like there's different features and things that have been built in and can be built in to help accommodate that. But I think we as vendors have the responsibility to escalate that and get that to an even better place. Thank you so much. Anything else? Oh, right here. And just like you were mentioning, um, the system that we're currently using has those features that you just said, sidebar rooms, things like that. Um, we deal with a lot of family cases uh -huh. um, and we have decided to move um, certain cases to online exclusively, like our default cases. Um, right. Somebody files a, for a divorce, there's no answer, so they go by default. Those are really high volume cases um, where a lot of people would actually be in the courtroom yeah. had it been in person. So yeah. those are the types of hearings that we've decided we can ex exclusively do via, uh, virtually because um, they act people actually wanted that in the first place before mm -hmm. the pandemic. So this is just <laughs> giving them what they wanted. <laughs> they, so. it, they are, and thank you for, for doing that. What are, just, John, one, one second, one more uh, question for, for this gentleman. So how is it, what's the general feel? So you said that, that's a lot of case volume. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Yeah, it's going great. Um, our bench is loving it. Uh, the, the litigants are loving it. The staff that actually have to um, prepare the cases, things like that, it works yeah. well for them. So um, that's definitely a win-win. We also have another court, accountability court for child support cases where those folks would actually be in person as well. Um, we have put some of those things online as well and do those hearings virtually. Um, it's, these are for the folks who, you know, want to pay their child support, but yeah. are having financial difficulties, things yeah. like that. They get coaching, um, mentoring, things like that. Those types of things we can do online and conduct workshops, things like that, so. Oh, thank you for sharing. Where are you from? Uh, Mar Maricopa County, awesome. um, Phoenix. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing. Back here uh, in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about the challenges, um, one of the challenges that we've been facing more recently, now that things are opening up with COVID, um, is the opposing parties objecting to people appearing via video. Uh -huh. um, most recently, we had one where the district attorney wanted to have their witness appear via video and the defense counsel objecting to it. So that, that's one of the challenges that I think we're going to start seeing more and more. And, and, and I don't know that there was any good reason not to yeah. have the witness on video, but I think it starts becoming a little bit more of a game at yeah. that point, a strategy. Could, could be, yeah. And, and I'm sure there's arguments to be made of being in person versus not and what you can read and the, the, you know, the visual cues and those types of things. Yeah, that's a, that's a well, well stated uh, potential hurdle. Thank you. Man, you guys have fed us some amazing uh, thoughts. I'm so, can I just say like, I'm super proud of, of all of you that have been through this and what you're doing. Like whether you're a Tyler customer or not, uh, 
the things that you've had to overcome in such a short period of time are absolutely unbelievable. And I think all of you should be commended for the work that's already been done and the work you're continuing to do. Um, if, if I, I think I, I was gonna pose this as a question, but I'm just gonna kind of pose it as a statement. I think if I were to say to this group, hey, if you were forced to go at, at some limited capacity, whether it's all of your cases, some of your cases, whatever, but if I said, you have to have something that you do exclusively online this year, I think all of you, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but I think all of you, if not the vast majority would be like, okay, I think I can do that, or I'm already doing that. And that's, oh, it's, it should be commended. You are awesome. So we talked about roadblocks. We talked about waypoints. Um, this is the last uh, thing that I want to, to kind of talk about and drive home. We do technology uh, and, and that's, that's what we do. This is another quote uh, from, from uh, Richard Susskind. It says, quote, the role of technology here is not to support and enhance our old ways of working, but to overhaul and often replace our practices of the past. I loved this because it kind of emphasizes everything that you all have been talking about today. We have decades of practice of doing things a certain way. Like I think all of us have those, those things and those nuances and I'm going to call them um, rituals that we go through. It's either the ritual of how we're tracking something or the ritual of there's this certain process that we have that has gone A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, because that's how we've done it since 1970. K, okay? don't ask questions. That's just how it's been done. Um, we're finally to a point where we're almost being forced to think through those. And we're like, oh my goodness, D steps D through H are essentially irrelevant because of what we have technologically now. And I'm so, like, I am so proud to, to say we've helped solve some of those problems. I'm more proud to say that you guys have been willing to contribute to the ideas in challenging us to come up with solutions to meet those needs and those expectations. And candidly, like I, I tend to agree with Susskind in that the future of courts is vastly different. Like 2030, in my perspective, is vastly different today than it was in 2019. 2030 looks completely different to me in 2022 than it did in 2019. And Oh, God, in a lot of good ways, in some scary ways, in some, my, our staff have new expectations of me ways, um, but I'm actually pretty excited at the changes that we're, we're able to enact and the things, the steps that we're, we're able to take because of what's, what's gone on and, and because of what we have in place. So this last slide, this was mostly just to say, I wanna make sure that you leave here knowing uh, what steps and what tools and what things are out there uh, for you to be able to take advantage of. So I won't, this is a list of, of Tyler solutions and you've all heard it, we've talked about it, you've heard about virtual court, you've heard about our online dispute resolution, all of these tools that I expect you to expect from us. You could expect us to have these and for these to be uh, available to you. But really, this is a roadmap of just ideas for you because we're not all gonna do this the same way. We're not gonna get to that same destination using exactly the same tools and exactly the same functions. I so appreciate the feedback that you've given to the group today on the ideas that you've already had, the expectations that you're seeing. I am appreciative that that in Maricopa, you guys are, are doing what you're doing and seeing what you're seeing, that in Arlington, that they're seeing similar things to what you're seeing. I, as a, as a vendor, I appreciate that you have the same problems as, as these people have, and you're solving them in unique and, and very advanced ways. I think it's really, really encouraging. I hope if you have time, please stop by our booth uh, and ask us about some of these solutions. We would be more than happy to discuss any ideas that we have, experience that we've had with clients uh, in overcoming some of these problems and helping find mutual solutions on those. I think if I were to leave uh, one thought in closing, 
It's just to echo what Suskin said. I think our responsibility as technologists is to think of the future, to be forward thinking on where things could go and trying to come up with the best possible solution for you to be able to get there. It's a tough thing. Like it's, it's not easy uh, trying to put these solutions together, especially when you consider, I mean, even within a state, your county, uh, you could be processing cases in a certain way and go right next door. And they're processing that same case type in quite a bit different way when it comes down to some of the process and automation and things that can be put in there. I would just, I would just lob out to you. Uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we have to try and be a part, a small part in what that future looks like for you. And if you have any questions, uh, any ideas, even any concerns, we would love to hear uh, from you about those. So please stop by uh, while you're here at the conference this afternoon or something. We'd be, we would love to have a conversation. But I do look forward to what the future will bring. I think we're well positioned both from the court expectations and from the general public expectations, we're very well positioned to be able to navigate this road that will take us to a 2030 that looks quite a bit differently than what we would have thought of in 2019. And I'm super excited to, to get there and to see what that looks like. I hope that we're able to automate a lot of things. I hope we're able to reduce some of those steps that we've had to do uh, in the past. I hope that we're able to accommodate staff that are having to multitask and they're having to juggle multiple different things at the same time. I think our technology is, is getting to a place where it can really help us balance some of that and where, where if at, at, at the very least, we make it a little bit easier to juggle some of those things that we're being forced to multitask on. That's our responsibility. That's what we look forward to doing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for participating. We, I took mental notes. I hope we took some good physical notes. Uh, we'll take this back and incorporate it into what we do. Thank you all so much uh, and enjoy the rest of the day.